Well, good afternoon. This is the taxi cab confession session. I'm going to be using this mic. Is there an echo in the back? Everybody can hear me okay? Speak up. Is this a little bit better? Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming. Taxi cab confessions. Uh, this is a great slot. I guess Luke Verblevsky got the hangover slot. This is the definitely not hungover anymore slot, right? Everybody's feeling good, rested. Great. So it's a it's a pretty simple case study presentation. What we did uh, is we worked with a new startup taxi company that wanted a dispatch system that would work an iPad in their fleet, and we built it with Drupal. So that's basically what I'm going to tell you about. So some of the things that I hope to uh, convey through this uh, case study is how Drupal was leveraged to do this uh, application, to build this application, um, why we felt that it was the right choice to build this rapid app, and hopefully I'll leave you with some ideas on how you can leverage Drupal in some of the ways and we have, that we have done to build the application and maybe extend that and use other tools to build other systems they'll do similar things. I think there are a tremendous number of opportunities to replace proprietary hardware with software, and I think Drupal is a, is a great tool to do that on an enterprise level, or not enterprise, and also to let you and your developers uh, leverage the skills they already have to build some of these cool things. So before I start going and talking about all this, um, I guess I want to learn a little bit about yourselves. Who's um, who here is a marketing decision maker, project manager? Cool. Okay. Uh, developer? All right. Wow. Themer? Just, okay, cool. So, uh, fair warning this is not a very technical presentation. Um, However, there are folks on, uh, on a team that have built this around, uh, so if you would like to stop by our booth, uh, uh, Brant Wynn is actually running a boff right now. He's not here, so he would be able to answer some questions. I have just roped in Johnny Fox, who's the project manager, who will be able to help me answer some of the more technical questions. So what I'll try to do, since my, my talk is not very technical, is I'll leave some time towards the end so you can uh, go ahead and ask some of those questions. And if you want to leave right now, hopefully not, you can do that. <laughs> All right, so who am I? Uh, my name is Andy Koharski. As you can see, I don't really take myself too seriously, um, take our work seriously. I, uh, this is me not being a firefighter, not dressing up for Halloween. I'm actually uh, biking home from, uh, it's at night and I'm, it's cold and it's in Chicago and I'm wearing a bike helmet. So if you see that on my, uh, some of the places online, that's me. Um, normal dress attire in winter. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Promet Source. Uh, we're a sponsor, booth 417. And uh, so a little bit more about the company. That's uh, some of the folks that are here with us uh, at, in Denver. We are based in Chicago. We are a full service technology uh, firm. We focus only on Drupal and mobile application development and providing Drupal managed services to sell things like 24-7 security updates and, and basically all the sexy support stuff that nobody wants to do. Um, about 40 team members and uh, most of us are in Chicago. As you, you'll see through this presentation, we do uh, mobile application development, both uh, native and hybrid, and I'll talk a little bit about that and do we, of course, implement responsive design uh, theme sites. All right, so, taxi cab confessions. Uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer, uh, we were approached by a group of investors who were starting up and kicking off a new business. This is a, a, a concept of a green taxi company in, uh, in Madison and now expanding into other areas of the country. It was, um, it, the concept was to deliver, uh, it was a marketing concept and a, an approach to, to providing different rides. Uh, the rides would be, 
the service would offer shared ride service to um, cut down on green gas footprint and also uh, on a cost. Uh, it would be equipped with uh, a fleet of Priuses and other uh, hybrid vehicles. And they wanted to do some things differently than traditional taxi companies. They wanted to differentiate themselves in the market. So they came, we've done some work with those folks before. They, uh, they approached us and said, well, we really want to build a different dispatch system. Well, we were buying a, a fleet of brand new Priuses and what we really want to do is not only paint them a nice green color and, and do th th things differently, we want to use different technology. We want to get away from having these clunky old boxes that sit inside of the cars and we want to have iPads in our Priuses and we want our drivers to be able to pull information at, at any given time and provide that information to the passengers. So can you build a dispatch system that's going to provide us with a two-way communication? Can you um, also there has to be a zone-based calculation so whenever somebody requests a ride we have to get the pickup location and the drop-off location because that's how we're going to calculate the ride. Um, we also want to track the location of the cars. Oh yeah, it has to be built in a month and a half because that's when the cars are getting rolling off and you know, if they don't have a dispatch system, it's just going to be sitting around losing lots and lots of money. So of course, we said yes, we can do that. At that point, uh, I was able to overrule some of the project, some of the risk averse project managers. Sometimes it works out for us. Um, and then just a little bit on a dispatch system. So, for example, if I'm going to go back to the airport today, I can walk outside a convention center and flag a cab, right? That's just a normal way that you would do it in New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Most of the time outside of those cities, what I would have to do is call and provide my information to a dispatcher or an automated system, provide an information about where I wanted to be picked up from and where I'm going. Then that information would be stored, maybe a fare would be calculated, and then at the time that I wanted to be picked up, the taxi would be dispatched. So generally what happens is either a particular car or a group of cars in a particular area where I'm getting picked up from gets a message and somebody accepts that message, right? So uh, five cars near the convention center, five taxis near the convention center right around. First one, the, the information goes to all five of them. The first one that accepts it, that message gets sent back to the system. It says, okay, taxi number one, two, three, four has their ride, comes and picks me up. Once I get in there, it changes another status to get loaded. I mean, the, it's, it's actually a status loaded. So, that's, that's how the, the dispatch system, the, the essential basic functionality of the dispatch system. Uh, as you can, so I think I illustrated this, definitely several points of information and, and information exchange between the mobile device and the, and the base system. Now, this is, uh, these are some images I took, um, actually just uh, from different, different cities of the devices that currently exist. A uh, couple points on this. This, as you can see, the, this is, it's because it's a hardware solution, it's extremely restricted on what it can do. Um, it's actually more expensive than putting iCab, uh, iPads in a car. These things run around $2,000 from what I'm told. And a little tangent on this, there are a lot of different hardware solutions right now that are just like this. They're limited, they're very expensive, they're clunky, they have a limited... UI interface, they have limited upgrade uh, ability. So it's, as you're looking at these devices and thinking about us, I would highly encourage you to think about many different industries where this model can be replicated. Okay, so we had a couple of different options. Uh, option one was to go, uh, well, they'll just refuse the work and the customer would go with the propri proprietary hardware solutions, which I just showed you. Option two was to build a custom code application. So this was something that we really considered, very, very much considered. Um, 
So use something like a framework, maybe Ruby on Rails or go with PHP, Code Igniter, Cake PHP, you know, model out the database, figure out you know, the traditional software development model, build the app. That was definitely something we looked at. Or option three, build the application using Drupal. So we did it with Drupal. Um, we used Drupal as a dispatch center. We obviously used the iPads as, as the mobile dispatch unit, and we used PhoneGap uh, for application development platform. Uh, this is actually an image of what the uh, inside of the Prius looks like with the mounted uh, uh, iPad in it. Okay, so why Drupal? Why did we decide to do that? Well, one of the reasons was that we really thought we can pull this off. Um, we also are the best set of skills that we had in-house were Drupal. So even though it might have made a little, just as much sense to use a completely custom a framework, we decided to use Drupal as a framework because we had felt comfortable with the fact that we had a set of skills in-house that could accomplish that work. And Drupal was giving us a lot out of the box already. So uh, we felt that the, the fact that we can do the development cycle very quickly, uh, we had the services module in there, we had security built in, we were able to provide immediate prototyping to the customer, and as I said, this is important, and, and for all the developers that are in here, you already have the skills to basically build these applications. There was no new skills that we had to go out and acquire. You can build the mobile app using services in Drupal, we just did it with the same skill set in the in house that we had while building other Drupal applications. So on the mobile side, we have to consider whether we're going to go with native or hybrid. And again, I'm going to focus a little bit on the, on the, set, on the fact that we had the, the, the skill set already there to implement this, this build. So, um, Native or hybrid, when I say native, I mean building uh, your iOS app or an Android app with the tools that they're, they're put out either by Apple or by uh, the Android uh, community. So building it for the, the specific device. Hybrid is essentially building it with the skills, that, with the language that you're already familiar with, so JavaScript, HTML5, uh, and there are frameworks out there that provide you with the ability to build that app call native, um, native functions on a device using JavaScript libraries or other, I think there are other uh, language packs now as well, and then uh, package or compile that application to run on many different devices. In our case, the hardware, that was, the hardware of choice was the iPad. So we went with PhoneGap. Uh, now, PhoneGap since then has been acquired by Adobe, and I think it has been given back to the community. It's part of the Apache project. It's part of the Apache project now. Um, but PhoneGap, for the development on the on the iPad, gave us all this all the tools that we really needed to do. So some of the disadvantages of using a hybrid approach is that you don't have the ability to call all of the functions on the on the hardware that you're running. So, you know, all the native uh, calls to all the functionality that your you know, iPhone, iPad, Android uh, device can do. However, we broke it down to be able to get geolocation, be able to get um, direction, and be able to get, um, actually that's it, I think geolocation was the main one. So that was a pretty easy choice. And again, using PhoneGap gave us basically the, the tools, the, the knowledge to build an application right out of the box because we already were doing similar things on the web. Okay, so what did the app have to do? So it had to save a ride request, so when I called in, somebody, was, uh, somebody is taking a, uh, a call request, it's saving it as a uh, content type into Drupal. We also, we, we also look up uh, re recurring ride requests. If I'm a repeat customer, I can look, they can look me up via phone number um, and just pull that information up. We had to be able to schedule a future ride request so the application can schedule 
to have me pick to have a taxi come and pick me up every Tuesday and take me to the airport and come and pick me up at the airport every you know Thursday night. Um, the other uh, cool thing, depending on how you look at it, um, zone best zone based ride calculation. I'm going to show you an image, but essentially what it is is there are two ways to which in which you can calculate a ride cost. One is when you sit down, there's a, there's a meter that kicks off, and, you, and as you drive, there's a charge per mile and then probably a charge per time that you're in a car. Another way of doing it is uh, as calculating it from zone A to zone B. Some of that is um, di dictated by municipalities. I know that we've looked at extending this application to um, services that are not as, as, as regulated as the taxi industry, so for example, limo companies and they, when we were able to apply the same zone uh, fare calculation. So like if you're going from, you know, Brooklyn to Manhattan or something, or Upper West Side, Lower East Side, or South Side, North Side of Chicago, we were able to create zones and, and for other applications be able to, to uh, create the cost calculations. Of course, the dispatch taxi, so the signal has to be sent out to the taxi when that, when that ride is ready to be picked up. The drivers receive the application, there's a little alert, a little alarm. They either accept or decline that ride. And during the ride, um, may have, uh, because there's a joint ride, that during the ride, the, the taxi um, dispatch system would have to be able to add more ride requests to that driver. And the driver would be able to decline or cancel the request. And of course, we, ha we have to display the location of the taxis. So here's a here's a, a basic view. Looking at uh, pulling up some ride information. So uh, a dispatcher is able to see uh, so that the rows towards the top are rides that are in progress. Uh, there are several statuses that uh, um, and the rows change the change color based on a status. So some of them are uh, ride is accepted, but the passenger hasn't shown up or um, the ride is in progress or it's waiting outside and then the ones in the blue are waiting to be assigned. We also are working on an automatic, automated assign system so there's no manual intervention um, uh, necessary but we can switch to different modes. So here's an image of beautiful Madison, Wisconsin uh, and unfortunately we chose orange to display the uh, taxis, so it doesn't show up very well here. But you can see the little donuts; those are the taxis, uh, and you can you can hover over those, get more information as to where they're going, which direction they're going, and the screen refreshes, uh, I think, every 15 to 20 seconds to provide information. Uh, here's an example of a zone. So we used open layers uh, and. Um, the zones were zone files where, um, okay, so here's a, here's a zone and um, it's basically ge a geo boundary and we, and based on a location, you know, we get let long of where the taxi is or where the pickup location is, then we figure out where they're going and based on that we, we have the, the ability to calculate the cost. But there are something like uh, 250, 254, 254 zones. So here's the iPad uh, app. I think the newer version is a little bit sexier. Uh, so it's basically be able to accept a ride, decline a ride. You can see uh, the, the driver can see which zone the pickup, where, which zone the pickup is in, which zone uh, it's going to. Now the application has the ability to map the route for the driver. So just by automatically, there's a link there where they can just say, okay, what's the fastest uh, route for me to, to get there? Uh, and there's more functionality that we've added since this uh, screen. So here's a, here's a section of the dispatch room. And some additional benefits of using this. So um, moving away from the traditional method uh, and, and, and just some benefits of using something like an iPad is that even though the, uh, we're only looking at the data plan for the devices, they're using Skype to be able to communicate with the drivers if something that the system cannot handle or there's an emergency or a problem happens. So they, they've loaded other applications to their drivers, so like Skype, and they communicate directly with the base. 
using that, with, you know, just using the data. Uh, we're also providing, uh, we also build in credit card processing using um, Little Square. Uh, we looked at using uh, Card.io, which was, I don't know if you guys saw the key, key note speech today, the Card.io. You can basically put in a, um, Card.io is an API that any application can use. You use the camera, and if you want to swipe a card, you, just, you can use that to call, basically get the card information. So you put the card in front of the camera, Card.io is a tool set that you can use. It'll, it'll take a picture of that and almost instantaneously give you all the information that's on the card. So it's an alternative to swiping it. Uh, and then additional benefits, because we're using uh, Drupal, we're able to uh, have vehicle fleet management and uh, driver management as well. So it's just more and more benefits are rolling with that. So a little bit on the architecture. It's pretty, pretty simple, right? You have Drupal running on top. Uh, we have community contributed, module, community contributed modules. Open layers was a really big part of what we're doing with the, with the driver maps. And, and the APIs are, are relying on, on getting that zone information. Uh, Google Maps, using that, using Google Maps to get a lot of geo information where we're putting addresses in on a dispatch system. And uh, services, we rely very, very heavily on services to talk to uh, the devices. Th there are some drawbacks, and I'm going to try to address that in a couple more slides. So, um, notable modules, open layers, like I said, services. CCK, views, and date module. That was very important for us. So I was very encouraged with the Whiskey Initiative um, when it was in the early stages, hoping that we're not going to have to uh, bootstrap the, the entire Google, or the uh, Drupal load every time. Unfortunately, it sounds like that's probably not going to happen quite yet. Um, that's one of the challenges that we ran into. While services module is fantastic, it allows for security. So we build in uh, the ability for the drivers to have to log in to the iPads, and it's using their login to actually um, control whether they are available for taking rides through the dispatch system and then we use another layer to make sure that the, that device actually has the ability to connect to our system it still boots the entire um, it, it still boots in it does the entire boot however again going back and looking at our decision this was something they were getting for free essentially with a Drupal install and a, and a services install so that allowed us to prototype and build this app much faster than if we had to build this thing from scratch, from you know using a framework. So essentially, we're kind of bending Drupal in a way um, to use it as a, as a framework. So some of the challenges that we had, um, we actually hit the Google API limit uh, pretty much the day after we launched. Um, that was on an oversight where we we're calling the uh, <laughs> we we're calling the uh, is testing. Yeah, testing was one of the challenges as well because we needed to figure out how to test with you know 30, 50 plus devices on a road. Um, not only just to assimilate the loads, but just to see you know if anything else, if anything funny was happening. And we weren't able to get the, all of those devices ready by then. Uh, so the Google Maps API limit, because we weren't able to test with all those devices, we didn't realize that. Um, and it, did I say this was like a six-week development cycle? Okay, so this is a six-week development cycle. But we forgot to pull out a, Ma a Google Maps API call in the devices, and we are relying on the native geolocation call to the device, but instead of we're using the Google API call. That Google API call has a limit. Does anybody know off the top? 2,500 a day? So, that was, uh, you know, all of a sudden everything stopped working. All the cars disappeared. That was kind of bad. But we fixed it right away. Um, we did take this into consideration. We wanted to limit the wireless traffic that was going back and forth. Um, so that, we, you know, when the, um, the, the iPads were purchased, they were purchased on a, with, a, uh, with a service plan. We didn't want to go over the, the whatever the, um, the bandwidth purchased was, was. So we did some testing on that. Oh, I should also mention that uh, with services, we're using JSON. 
that was a that was a really a, 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 at first we looked at looking you know, using XML, but it was a very it, very quickly we just came to the conclusion that JSON is much 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 easier, and it's much easier because it's JavaScript that's predominantly used on the uh, PhoneGap app, the native app, sorry the hybrid app, and also it works really well. The JSON works really well with services in Drupal. And uh, unfortunately, because every uh, interaction with the uh, iPad is on an authenticated level, and, and they communicate with the uh, with the with the Drupal application several times a minute, or more than that, um, after the database grew, we started seeing some performance issues. So that's still that's still a problem. Uh, like I said, we would love to have to do this without boot, bootstrapping the, uh, Drupal every time we make a call. Uh, but we're, going, we're, we're getting around that. Um, we're rewriting some of the views on a dispatch center and we're doing, calling the um, geolocation updates a little bit smarter. But that was a consideration. Uh, another thing to mention is that uh, I think there are more ways to do this now, but when we uh, when we're rolling this out, there are three ways that we we uh, we could roll out the code to the Apple device. Uh, the first several we did with an iOS SDK, so we literally um, just hooked up the device to the developer's uh, uh, laptop and installed it there. Uh, the App Store uh, is another option, and we used an enterprise program where. If we provided uh, the App Store the um, UID of the, of the of the device, they were able to basically uh, over the air install the application. So that's a very helpful model. Now uh, the App Store, the Apple App Store, uh, allows us to create subscription uh, to sell this application as a subscription service. So you can run it and install it as long as you pay a monthly recurring fee. So that's built into the App Store. That's kind of cool if you're building enterprise applications like this. So some next steps. Um, we are actually replacing the uh, PhoneGap hybrid model with a native, uh, with a native build app. Uh, we're Building the ability to SMS customers, we're working on. Uh, we're talking about doing automatic driver routing. It's done. Um, <laughs> in app navigation, that's also done. Uh, we're also talking about um, creating a metered functionality. So instead of doing the, the cost calculation that goes between from zone to zone, essentially, um, you know, like if you use the, you know, who uses like Map My Run type. App? App. So you take your iPhone and you run with it for you know, however long, and you stop and you look back, and it traces your your route. So basically, the same principle to to create uh, the uh, to create basically to figure out what the distance is that the taxi was traveling, and figure out the cost of the ride based on number of miles traveled. And we're doing a lot of reporting and, and um, driver management, those, that type of stuff, with Drupal. And finally, um, has this launched yet? That's in testing. That's it's, it's, testing. it's any minute now, any day, any day. So we built a, and there's several of these out there already, but we've built this uh, particularly for, for this company who's expanding into other cities in the US. Uh, and this also inter interacts with Drupal. It's a native application that essentially lets you, so if I'm, if these guys had a service in Denver, I would be able to pull out my, app, my, my phone, load the application and say, I am in this location and I need a taxi right now. It would create a call to the dispatch, or it's actually gonna, first it's gonna figure out, it's gonna let me figure out the exact address of where I am, request that ride. Once that ride request happens, that gets saved to Drupal. It goes into our, uh, into our dispatch application and then the, the one, what I think is a pretty cool thing is that we're, we're allowing the user to track the taxi, right? Because as soon as the driver accepts the ride, we can track where they are, so I can track where my, where my, where my car is coming. 
So I'm, I'm wrapping up, uh, I think this is actually a little bit early, um, but in conclusion, I wanted to, I hope I have illustrated through this case study that we made a decision to use Drupal as a framework to connect to many distributed mobile devices. And we're able to pull that off in a very, very short time frame. This was a six week development cycle. We're able to use all the skills that we had in house. So at that point, we didn't have any uh, iPhone, iOS developers. All we knew was PHP, JavaScript, Drupal, Drupal, and just worked very hard. And obviously, we have to thank the community for providing these services to be able to do that uh, right away. So we're looking forward to seeing what's going to happen with Whiskey or the form or initiative formerly known as Whiskey, so we can do some of these things faster. But it's possible out of the box right now with the skill set that everybody has. So with that, I'll be happy to take some questions. Uh, can you talk to, I, I kind of have two questions that are, that are a little bit related. One, did you guys happen to look at Titanium Accelerator while you were uh, considering uh, the hybrid app? And so if you would mind talking about the decision point between PhoneGap and, and Titanium, if there was one. And also, uh, you said you're going native after having done a hybrid. What are the, what are the pain points that are, or, or why are you going native after having done hybrid? Okay, I'll, so Johnny, will you help me out with some of these questions? Yeah, yeah I'll put sure. this down here. All right, so this was developed um, like a year and a half ago, so titanium was not as mature at the time. Uh, we wanted to do something very quickly, so uh, PhoneGap really is a web page just written and wrapped inside of a native wrapper. So, you know, we had a high degree of confidence that with PhoneGap we could deliver and meet our deadline, and, and so that was really the choice of doing that. Um, it's kind of the challenge with PhoneGap, and I think it's a more mature platform now, but at the time, PhoneGap loads your entire application into one page. So on the device, it's possible to run out of memory when we start loading a lot of JavaScript operations running. Uh, now we've added mapping into the, um, into the PhoneGap app, and occasionally the browser will just crash because you're, you are actually using uh, just a, a browser Basically, so um, with adding mapping, credit card processing, um, some of the other things, native is just quicker, and uh, also just um, you know, as a web page, you're you're polling, so um, the uh, ability to use Apple push notifications uh, as native uh, is just it's a little bit better that way. All right. Um, I'm guessing a lot of this is, at least with the um, phone gap in, in implementation, is pulling as opposed to pushing out to the clients. And then also, can you talk a little bit about your data architecture, sort of how you structured relationships and all that between how you, how you built out nodes maybe on this? The node architecture, I can't speak to as much where some of that is being re-architected. You know, it was, it was done very quickly, and if you think about just the size of the project, you know, six weeks. That's kind of word go, design, architecture. Uh, so performance has been some of the things we've come back and re-engineered so that it pulls slower. Uh, as I was mentioning, we're rewriting it so that we're going to have push notifications to push to, um, um, to the device. Uh, we're probably going to use uh, some Node.js also to use, make use of WebSockets uh, and reduce that load on the server. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, um, so I've been a mobile developer for the last three years and I've never really used PhoneGap or any of those. Can you speak up a little bit? <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I've been a mobile developer for the last three years and I've never used uh, PhoneGap or AppCelerator or any of those things. I was wondering how um, easy it is to follow the UI guidelines for uh, the different devices when you're using PhoneGap. It's fine. There's, you know, thousands of apps that use PhoneGap. You just have to kind of follow a lot of the, um, the guidelines. Well, if you're using enterprise distribution, for one thing, you do not have to comply with those guidelines. Is we actually have where um, a private distribution where they're able to sideload the device into there, so we're able to do whatever we need to 
for a proprietary application like that. Uh, the consumer app does have to pass the UI guidelines, uh, and it is in native. Uh, so, you know, it's it's like any other app that at that point. Um, two questions, really. Um, the first one being, what other use cases do you see for an application like this, um, either in, you know, this type of cab or service industry with vehicles or, um, you know, transportation of sorts? And the other one being, how much of this can be contributed back to the community so we can build other apps like this w with this model? Great question, Eric. Two questions. So, I dream of and think of use cases all the time. For this, so, um, and we've been talking to other limo tax limo companies that want to use this. Uh, so obviously, we can extend that to the transportation industry, it's very specifically around you know taxi limo type industry. There are to ex there are many, many, many more use cases if you extend this application a little bit further. For example, uh, servicing application. Mm -hmm. So if I am a um, a snow plow, and we have a big, big snow in Chicago. I can load up all the places that I have to uh, plow uh, as a private plower, and and go to and just check them off as I go along. I can then this application can maybe even help me organize, which is my, what's my efficient, most efficient route, or as a you know pool cleaner, right? Same thing. Load up your workflow, or if you you know if you're um, a delivery driver, and all of a sudden you have an uh, to, you know, you, you, you can carry a little bit more inventory on your truck, and if you have a new order that comes in, you can dispatch to that driver where to go and what to load off using a similar application. I mean, um, trans, uh, I've, I've been sitting around a pool and a vacation and was speaking to a landscape business owner who said, I need this type of application exactly like this so I can sometimes my routes to my folks change and I wanna be able to do that. Second uh, question, uh, you know, how to contribute this back to the community. I mean, you know, we're basically, you know, all the stuff that we used is, um, aside from the PhoneGap phone app, it's, it's pretty much pure Drupal out of the box, contributed modules, open layers, all of that stuff is, is out there. Um, we haven't had a discussion around contributing uh, the PhoneGap app back, but that's a really good that's a really good point. Um, so there's no real custom code that could be contributed back as a module or an install profile. No, I mean it's 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 one web page. The phone gap. The the phone gap app is really just one page. I mean it's it's a very simple page um, of doing that, and it's it's just calling services with a JSON call, and when it gets those back, it you know populates those divs on the screen. You know you have your buttons. Um, very simple stuff. Okay. I'll, I'll, you know what I'll do is I'll try to re-architect this to be a little bit more technical talk and at the next CD mug, uh, so we're both from Chicago, but I'll, I'll try to give, um, and, and we'll post this up, this is, we'll post this up and we'll try to post some of the code up. Um, you know, it's probably a little ugly because it's been, it, you know, took, uh, it was it's development six, it's been cleaned up, oh good, good. <laughs> so yes, we'd be happy to, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. What kind of subscription model are you using for this app distribution? Yeah, so this for this particular customer, it's um, it's an enterprise level distro, so it's basically they just have it, right? They just give us UIDs and and they have it. Um, we have talked about, um, and, and I, I I'm not going to remember the, the terminology. There is a subscription model on the app store. That, that you can have enterprises purchase this. Now, as a business model, you know, they also need the dispatch center that's gonna be configured to, sp to speak to a set of devices. So, uh, you know, we're working on that right now because they're, they're opening up in a different city. So, um, it's gonna, you know, to, to extend it to thousands and thousands of different businesses, what you have to do is install the base, the dispatch system, and then attach the devices to that system. So it's a two-point install, the base and then an on-device install. So what we, one of the things that we talked about is doing, having a price for the base install, and then having a recurring, a pretty low base price install, and having a recurring revenue model uh, that would be purchased through the iStore, iPhone app store. <laughs> 
yeah. um, on a re and pay for it on a recurring mo monthly basis something like five or fifteen bucks. So, um, is it going to be like in-app purchases, or there is an another recurring? Like I, I'm just concerned. Like, is there a model that exists for recurring billing for apps yet? Is there a model exists for recurring billing of apps? Like yeah, there is an app. app uh, yeah, the App Store has a recurring billing model for apps on an enterprise level. It's the, it's there. You can put your app out there. And, and charge recurring billing for it. Thanks. Thanks. So I have a couple of questions. One is, of the forty plus, how many, how many of your staff were on this project? And then, w how much were you able to actually develop in parallel? And can you kind of describe like some, some of the, the maybe pieces that ended up being bottlenecks because they took a lot more effort than, than you originally anticipated? Yeah, great question. So we had, actually it was a pretty lean staff. We had two senior developers, a project manager, a business analyst, and a QA person um, working on this. At one point we had uh, uh, maybe a themer uh, help out, but very insignificant. So it was a very lean project, and we wanted to do that so that you know we didn't have too many people tripping over each other. And, and when we broke it down, we, we obviously the timeline was more, one of the more important, one of the most, one of the very important considerations. So uh, you know we pretty much had free reign at any resources that needed to be on it. And when we broke down the work, and we looked at the backlog and and, and what needed to be done, and we 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 kind of decided once the piece was architected that it really could be two people. So uh, from what I remember, some of, the, uh, some of the problems that we had were um, updating the location of the, of the cars. That took us a little while to figure out. Um, and it, it's just because, I mean, it's easy. You know, now, we, now that we know what we're doing, it's easy. But when we were first looking at it, that was, uh, that was slightly difficult. Um, I think what ended up happening is we it, 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 we had a you know, very good uh, coincidence where the cars were late. The cars were delivered a little bit late, so we had like one more week to test, which we worked out most of the kinks. So that was very helpful. Uh, did I answer all your questions, Johnny? Do you have a comment on that? Difficulties that we ran into. The performance, it, it, performance was an issue, but not right, uh, right away. No, just testing through all the, the use cases, normal you know, kind of problems with testing when you have you know, one system that talks to each other, just as we've been going through ongoing development. You know, that's, uh, we had some issues with uh, testing what's going on inside of the web page, but uh, iOS, um, the new S SDK uh, actually allows you to use Safari's inspector for inspecting what's going on inside of the PhoneGap app. Uh, really uh, expedites uh, troubleshooting. Otherwise, you have to put in JSON or uh, JavaScript alert boxes to see what's going on inside the PhoneGap app. Okay. Hey guys, uh, great case study. Thank you. Um, so I'm just curious. You mentioned that you used Open Layers and the Google Maps API. So can you talk about kind of the division, what, what features of each that you used? Yeah, I mean, we used, um, so Johnny, you can back me up. <laughs> All right. Uh, open layers is used on the dispatch screen to map the ride that where, where the taxis are, and it was used to layer the zones. Mm -hmm. um, Maps API was to take the address input and get a lat long. Did you so, code? sorry. No, I, go ahead. Yeah, so so basically, clean, use that to clean out the input, clean up the input, uh, provide you know if it's a guess that Google Map Google Maps API uh, brings back. Yeah, so that's how those are used. So then, are you using any caching for the maps on the iPad side of things? I'm just curious about like how much data, you know, I imagine these iPads are on all day, every day. So how much data are they, are they actually using for, from a data plan? 
Yeah, they're they're close. They're about I think 60, 70 percent. They're not going over like the basic basic plan, whatever that is. Yeah. Wow. All right. So the, so it sounds like the maps are being cached then. There's the, well, the, the maps map are the maps are not called every time they they go the um, the uh, location is actually sent from. Uh, for mapping is sent to the dispatch board, so it depends on how often they're seeing it on there from the device location. The only time that they'll call for Google Maps is if uh, if he's needing to be routed to a location he's not familiar with. Okay. So from, from the uh, iPad device, it's just absolutely submitting the raw so this is longitude. the view that most of the time the, the the cars have on the ipad yeah exactly okay. yeah the and what i what i had is a consumer app which might have been a little right. bit misleading because i was bringing up the map the maps are actually on a dispatch uh, right. a, a application which is a drupal app sitting at the desktop now they're able to link the pickup and, and a drop-off location and pull up just a google map in a web page which yes, it does consume tra uh, uh, bandwidth, but these these calls are you know they don't make an uh, the apps the yeah, the Google the iPads don't make a call to Google Maps for location. Okay. They use the the native call to get the current that long, and then they do send that back to dispatch, but it's a small call. All right, so this is my last little question. Then yeah, I guess yeah, I'll sit down. Um, so I, I guess I was assuming that. The app that you guys created actually will help navigate the driver to the pickup, but you're using like the standard like, maps application or okay. Yeah, that's it. So, do we use any? Do we build our own navigation? No, we didn't. The the what we are working now right now, which is kind of cool, is to be able to, or I guess it's already done to be able to automatically assign the driver to the pickup location. Um, so that's you know a little bit of intelligence built in based on location of the driver to yep. pick up. Part part of the reason for going to a native app is right now we're calling the own device uh, map kit. If you're familiar with iOS, uh, is we're just calling it as an external application. So in the native version, we'll be just embedding that as a as a native control. It's, it's just a little bit more natural that way. Um. Maybe I didn't catch it, but how did you overcome uh, this uh, uh, bootstrapping problem? That's a great question. We haven't. <laughs> Do you have plans just to move everything to to different solution, like out of the Drupal? We actually don't. Um, you know, we're right now uh, figuring out how you know, how many cabs can run on this thing. Um, believe it or not, what we would do is uh, we'd probably re eliminate views and write our own queries. That would be the first thing. So that, you know, if we had, I mean, this thing generates, it, it's actually amazing how many ride requests are generated by this small taxi company. It's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of rides requests in there. It's about a thousand rides a weekend. Every th a thousand rides a weekend? Um, so, So sorry. So on the performance side, uh, yeah, the the, the 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 communication with from from the app, from the cars. Obviously, we were figuring out how many we would like to be able to ride. You know, have 500 iPads in a single installation without any problems. Some of the problems that we the first uh, problems with performance that we have seen is actually from the view, because it's, you know nothing can be cached. Right? There's no caching almost done it's it's even on a database on a database layer it's like every uh, it, you, the caching stays in there for just a couple of seconds because there's there's an update almost all at all time and every user is a is an authenticated user on a Drupal instance so this is the biggest this was the first and the biggest pain for us so so we may be actually rewriting this and not using views so we have to give up a little bit of the of the of the ease of views but you know, we're going to gain some performance. I mean, we looked at the queries in there and we modified them, but they, they were kind of ugly. Well, the problem with bootstrapping is you're you're loading up the entire Drupal stack in order to, to process one request, as opposed to just going in that one thing that you need to do. Um, so, um, you know, as each one of these um, 
cabs is out in the field and it's making a post to Drupal, it's, it basically loads up the whole stack to do that. Um, so um, I don't know. We, we haven't we haven't addressed that problem yet. Uh, we've basically been able to overcome the performance problems by uh, MySQL tuning, uh, by restricting some of how many rows are requested in the view, and extending uh, the time between polls. Yeah, I mean that's the classic problem that I think Dries was talking about in his keynote, right? And and Larry spoke to and it's one of the initiatives for eight and. Again, unfortunately, it looks like bootstrapping is not going to be part of initiative formerly known as Whiskey, is the talk that he gave earlier. And that is, you know, when you're just looking for a JSON object to get out of Drupal, you don't want the whole page load, right? You just, I just want to be able to say authenticate and just give me that object. You know, and Drupal tries to check for things like are there blocks on this page, are there views, that, what else do I have to execute, all the things that are happening. So I think, you know, we like to think of Drupal, and, and, and there was a question earlier, and that is, you know, what other, what, where, what are, what are the other case, use, bleh, use, use cases, cases <laughs> that you can, that, that we think of when we try to, you know, we're looking at this app. We think that Drupal could be used as a, as a data warehouse of, of data and information and, and be used and extended for many, 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 many uses. Um, I mean, there's like, I, you know, there's something new I learn about you, you, the, every day about how you, people are using Drupal and especially in that way. And we prop, and we, we promote that use to our clients, and and we're hoping to. And I think somebody's going to solve it. We'll probably have to look at solving it ourselves, or, or at least contributing into that direction. And that is, I want to be able to use Drupal to pull information. And, and I mean, all of you guys are going to be able to be doing that in a couple of years anyway, right? I mean, who? It, you know, it may not be an HTML, HTML uh, HTTP re response or HTML response that you're looking for to pull data out of Drupal or put data into Drupal, right? I mean, it's unknown how many how the devices are going to be inter inter interacting with the with Drupal. But even though, although it has these limitations, it lo it's a little bit slow because it loads of the whole thing. It is still easier for us, in my opinion to house uh, data into Drupal and to migrate into Drupal because you get all of, these, all of these things for free and then build an app around that to pull information out, whether it's in real time or whether it gets updated and it gets stored in local or, you know, you can use m m Drupal to build your mobile apps and extend it. I mean, you know, we're building apps that have, for example, uh, instructions for tractor spraying systems in 16 different languages. Well, if something changes, what we did is we can just reach back into Drupal and pull that information out. So we check for updates that way. I think I answered that question, right? Hey, um, I just wanted to join into the bootstrap um, conversation. Though the problem is actually that services runs a full bootstrap every time, so views are ex especially heavy then. Um, but um, there I actually want to build services 4.0 at least uh, without a bootstrap. So that's probably, probably a good point for you guys to join in there in the development of services maybe and uh, then get a better product for yourself and then also get a better product for the community out of there. So um, that's one of the things on the list. And then the second thing, maybe uh, I came in a little late. So do you use push notification at all or do you pull everything? One of the recent updates is we are um, moving to push notifications. Uh, there's a mixture right now because there's some legacy um, pieces that need rewritten, but we'll eventually be going to all push notifications. Yeah. No, because we have some application we use push notification, and that solves a lot of the issues there. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that heads yeah. up. That's and that's great. And the third thing quickly here, I don't know if you guys use it or look into it because you go back to native. Um, something we just started doing is like Flash Builder. So there's a lot of old ActionScript uh, developer out there probably which are like work, uh, have no work these days anymore because everything is Web 2.0. So if you go Flash Builder, so the next generation of Flex, you can build pretty much an ActionScript 3 applications which are cross-platform and you can use the services via AMF PHP server instead of JSON, so you natively talk to Flash. Those applications are then built natively in Android and in uh, Objective-C, basically. So they're, they're really native, native, so full performance. Mm -hmm. so it's a very interesting approach, if you want to look into that. Um, we have two projects out there right now, and uh, yeah, it's very performant, it works really well.
Oh, that's nice. cool. That's good info. And thanks for that services. That's that's key. Like I, I, I want it. So I just want to make sure everybody here, because there's a lot of developers here. So uh, services module is now working on actually bypassing the bootstrap problem. So if anybody wants to help contribute, we'll definitely try to look into that. That that's a worthy cause for mobile. Do you use um, Google traffic at all, or do you have some way of like kind of collecting from your drivers, like, don't go down 2nd Avenue because they spilled a bunch of beer or something. <laughs> well, I know I use Google traffic a lot, but no, we, um, but that's personally, we have not built that into the app. That's a, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, one, it's, it's, a, it's a question of, of budget and maybe in further iterations we do that because when a driver routes that, writes their ride, we don't take into consideration traffic. Now, we are relying on Google to do that so may, because we're just pushing them basically out to Google Maps. Um, so if they, you know, they, they might have a little bit more resources. I don't know if they're figuring that out yet. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.